My name is George Seidel. I'm a professor of biomedical sciences at Colorado State University. I grew up on a dairy farm, and it was a slippery slope. I went to Penn State uh, and uh, studied dairy science, dairy cattle production. Well, for my master's degree, uh, we worked on semen collection from bulls and just optimizing procedures for collecting semen some semen biochemistry and things like that. Um, and then for my PhD, we worked on uh, superovulation of calves. So making one to five month old calves into mothers by getting embryos from them and so on. And at the time, were these relatively new uh, fields? Well, the uh, work for my master's degree was refinement mostly of things that have been done before, which is, is typical of master's degrees. And then the, the PhD work uh, just delved a little bit further into uh, some other work that had been done with superovulated calves. <clears throat> so um, we, in fact, even uh, got a pregnancy from one of those by transferring the embryos. Well, uh, there had been very little success I did my graduate work. Uh, as an example, there have been uh, some modicum of success in uh, mice and hamsters and so on. No success in farm animals at all. And in fact, it wasn't until quite a few years later that the first success occurred with, with cattle. Uh, meanwhile, uh, work progressed in the human turns out that it's much easier to do in vitro fertilization in humans than farm animal species for uh, reasons that do make sense once you understand the biology and so on. What embryo transfer does is amplifies the reproductive rates of the female in the same way that artificial insemination does for the, for the male. And so uh, we did a lot of research in optimizing those procedures. That is. Uh, making them work on an everyday basis. Uh, the procedures were done entirely surgically when I started doing this kind of work. And, uh, we developed non-surgical methods. Cryopreservation of embryos came, uh, came along and that uh, greatly facilitated things because it didn't need to be done in real time. So once you're superovulating a valuable cow, you've got all these embryos recipients of the hard to rise stage of the reproductive cycle. If you can cryopreserve the embryos, then uh, the embryos wait for the recipients. And that's much less expensive and so on. So uh, there were a, a lot of those kinds of practical things that we did here at Colorado State University to make things work just a little bit better than they, or a lot better than they did before. So it depends how we define cloning. So um, the main uh, Thing that our lab was known for in that area is simply cutting embryos in half. You do that with a microblade uh, under a microscope. A microblade is nothing more than a fragment of a razor blade. It turns out that uh, if you transfer embryos, the pregnancy rate is about 65% uh, per embryo. If you cut them in half, it's about 50% per half since there are two halves, the net effect is getting about a 100% pregnancy rate per original embryo. So that uh, was the main application of, uh, of that technique. And it, it's really very simple, effective, and so on. So we've made hundreds of calves here using that, those procedures. Uh, again, uh, the main application is you get more calves if you do that. So it was sort of like creating twins? Yeah, so it's okay. creating identical twins. And you can cut them into thirds and make identical triplets too. So that's one method of cloning. Another is with uh, nuclear transplantation. And of course that eventually uh, led to uh, the Dolly experiments. And uh, actually one of the uh, participants in those experiments uh, spent three years in our laboratories here before going to Scotland. Most of that has been uh, in the context of trying to understand 
why some of the calves are abnormal when that procedure is used. And so we've done a lot of work along those lines. It turns out that the calves actually are fairly normal, but the placentas are abnormal. And so um, being born from a normal placenta is traumatic enough. Being born from an abnormal placenta creates even more problems. And uh, while that's not all that's going on, that's the, the main problem, and we've done some research to understand that particular uh, phenomenon. What kind of abnormalities? So the the overriding one is uh, what's known as large offspring syndrome. The calves are larger than they should be in some cases. And what kind of reaction have you gotten from producers who maybe use these technologies? So uh, we have uh, transferred a lot of embryos here at the university for cattle producers, in fact, uh, uh, many thousands of, of embryos. Uh, on the average, we do very well, and sometimes we do spectacularly well, and sometimes there are spectacular failures. Probably t t training a lot of students <laughs> who then go on to satisfying careers and so on. Uh, the main thing we're known for recently is sexing sperm. And what we did is, um, again, took procedures that worked marginally on a research basis and we made them practical. And so now sex semen is available um, quite widely, worldwide, and it's used a fair bit in dairy cattle. Well, um, there are almost infinite things that one can do with these technologies. Um, so an example is uh, transgenic technology, and there's a public perception that this is problematic. Um, although interestingly, we're uh, I, I believe it about 90 percent transgenic corn these days in the United States, right at 90 percent transgenic soybeans. Um, the majority of the cotton that's grown is transgenic. And so we're eating all this stuff anyway from plants, and um, I think eventually we'll be uh, modifying animals that way as well. So what are some of the things you might do with that technology? Uh, for example, improve disease resistance to animals. Um, there are some techniques uh, to decrease mastitis in dairy cows <coughs> by, by introducing new genes. Then there are new concepts that are coming along all the time. A recent one is fetal programming. So um, we've always known to some extent that uh, we're affected by uh, what we eat. And uh, when mothers are malnourished, uh, mal uh, uh, their offspring sometimes have problems. We're finding that that's not a genetic thing, but it's something that happens. Um, as the fetus adjusts to its expected environment. And it turns out that these things stay with one for life. Well, first, uh, there are a lot of job opportunities out there, and it's interesting work and so on. Um, interestingly, the majority of my students, um, who are graduate students, postdoctoral students, end up running human in vitro fertilization laboratories. And so uh, they're, they're really quite successful at that, paid well, and, and so on. So um, if the reproductive technologies are something that interests students, then of course uh, one needs to get an undergraduate degree first. And then uh, there are various options. One is to go to veterinary school, one is to go for a master's or a PhD degree or both and so on. Um, there are also jobs out there without the advanced degrees.